Welcome back to the live stream of Stephen Friends. This week we have Rob Johnson. Rob is the president of the Institute of New Economic Thinking, INET, founded back in 2009. Enjoy the show. Welcome back to Steve and Friends. I'm Ty Keens. Uh, we have a special guest today, uh, Rob Johnson. We have Steve Keen with us and we have Daniel Sanderson. Um, it's February 18th, 2023. Uh, just some housekeeping notes. Make sure you hit the like button and make sure you subscribe and make sure you join in the chat. I'll turn that on right now. There we go. Um, it's been quite successful over the last few weeks, so we'll keep that going. We're going to do an extension um, from now on. It's a live extension, so we're going to go an extra hour. Doesn't necessarily mean our guest is going to stay that long. Obviously, it's a Saturday and people have previous engagements. Um, and stay with Steve. If he has the time, he'll stick around. And that way we can kind of just go off the rails at that point, engage with the chatters, and just see where the conversation goes. Um, I think that'll be a uh, fun. We often get a lot of our viewers in the second 30 minutes of the first half hour towards the 45 minute mark. And then we're going off the air 15 minutes later. So I kind of want to capitalize on the people that are getting the notification, taking some time to come in. I know everybody's busy on a Saturday, so we appreciate you joining in. So we're going to try to extend it there just so we can engage with you guys. Uh, we're on Twitter um, at Prof Steve Keen. If you can go there or if you're there, retweet and like. Um, but then I encourage you to come on to Prof Steve Keen on YouTube and join the conversation. Um, it's it's really fun to engage with you guys. Say hello. Uh, we had a lot of good uh, chatters last week and we want to keep that going. I'm going to bring on the man himself first, um, Professor Steve Keen. Steve? Hi, right. Good How to be here doing? with the decent data. Going to be with a decent data connection other than in Amsterdam for this uh, particular week rather than back in London. Yeah, which, uh, two, two weeks in a row now. now. Yeah, well, it's going to be uh, next week is back to London again. So I'm crossing my fingers that a data, uh, a data a dongle that I've ordered actually has arrived there and I can get it set up in time. Oh, that should be interesting. I like a show yeah. that has complex problems. Um. I would. <laughs> I would rather have a decent internet. Forget the problem. We've got enough of those. A functional internet is what I'm after. What I'm after. All right, Dan. How you hey. doing, buddy? Oh, Saturday. The sun is shining. It's uh, a beautiful day in the neighborhood. Perfect. Perfect. Anything uh, new during your week, Daniel? Oh, just a whole lot of philosophy writing, and uh, uh, the, the choices are abundant. What is, what is what is a what does a creator create, and what do they do? What 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 move is next, and what appearance? All this kind of stuff. So yeah, it's uh, yeah. it's always it's always a battle of of uh, trying to allocate your time. Wow. All right. Well, you know what? Let's bring on the man, the actual man, man himself, Rob Johnson. Rob. Hey, Rob, how you doing? All I look at that Good. picture. I thought I was going. I thought I was going to see a blues artist. <laughs> <laughs> well, Hound okay. on my trail. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, so let's. Um, I, I want to just jump right into it. I'm going to let um, Steve and Rob kind of talk this out. Uh, maybe mm -hmm. we'll start with Steve first. How did you two come together in the past? When was it? What were the circumstances? Well, I mean, the circumstances are really the global financial crisis. That's the beginning of making contact with Rob and um, and Rob and Brent Allen Epic being created. So I was one of the people, you know, warning about the crisis before it happened, following obviously non-orthodox economics. And at the same time, uh, George Soros, uh, who was the original funder of INET, was you know he's been equally a critic of economics in the same way that uh, 
uh, you, you, know, you get uh, I mean, whether well, Berkshire Hathaway, uh, the principles of Berkshire Hathaway being critics of mainstream economics. And for the same reason, they, they said, well, mainstream economics says you can't make money trading on the stock market. Uh, I think we can make money trading on the stock market. It's not rational. It's not prophetic, et cetera, et cetera. Both had, you know, extremely successful uh, techniques of doing that. And when this crisis struck and mainstream economics was completely uh, wrong about what was going to happen in 2008, they were predicting, you know, bright sunshine. We walked into the darkest days since the Great Depression. Um, so I, Soros said he'd fund the Institute for New Economic Thinking. And Rob was, I didn't know Rob at all at the time, of course, but Rob was, uh, you know, one of the uh, advisors to Soros and put his hand up to run INET. And uh, I didn't get involved in INET initially. I'll give you a bit of a confession here, Rob. I was a bit skeptical. Uh, but what changed my skepticism was when you funded my friend Leanne Usher. Hmm. Uh, the first round of grants. And I thought, well, if we're going to fund Leanne, and Leanne does work in multi-agent modeling, non-equilibrium thinking, uh, very, very intelligent stuff about using what she called zero intelligence traders to simulate the market, which is the exact opposite of what neoclassical have. They have Nostradamus and Jesus and try to simulate <laughs> but Nostradamus and Jesus, you know. So here's the yarn doing stuff with zero intelligence traders and doing a better job of capturing the market dynamics than the neoclassicals did. So after that happened, I thought, well, you know, okay, there might be interest in what I'm doing. So I put forward my proposal for funding my simulation software and on a whim, but a you know, very, very well-founded whim at the time, I hadn't thought of a name for what I wanted to create. Uh, the idea was to use the capacity to model financial dynamics using double entry bookkeeping uh, and, and to make that feasible in, in a system dynamics framework. And I thought, why not call it Minsky? So I put the bidding in for Minsky. Now, now I'm going to be a bit knock, knock back a bit. Bob can have a go at me here if he likes. And that is, I gave them three titles. I said, uh, if you give me a quarter of a million, I can write a standalone program. If you give me, I think, 198,000, I could um, tack it into another software package, one called Viz, VizSim, which still existed at the time. It's unfortunately molded. I said, well, if you give me half of that, like 128,000, I can write you a Mathematica notebook that'll do it. And they said, well, we can only give you 128,000, but you want the standalone program. <laughs> so I found myself working a lot harder than I wanted to with limited funding. But the, the luck was that at the same time, my great friend and uh, brilliant, absolutely brilliant programmer, Russell Standish, happened to be available. So rather than getting, mm. you know, trying to get a bunch of cheap Indian or Russian programmers to do it for me, I got a guy I regard as one of the world's geniuses in software. And so uh, that was the initial version of, uh, of, of Minsky. And uh, I don't know if you know this, Rob, but uh, I've had to say who's the world's greatest um, modeler in Minsky. It's Tyrone Keynes. And I'm looking at yeah. him showing you All what, right. what, can, what, what can be done with Minsky. So that's, that's my yeah. background. Rob and I first met, I think I came over to New York at some stage. Right. But yeah, yeah. yeah. And, uh, you know, so we've been in touch uh, for about a decade or at least, I'd say. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I think the, the reason that there's been continued um, agitation about the nature of economics after the financial crisis is fundamentally, fundamentally because INET has provided funding to students through what they call the Young Scholars Initiative to enable uh, rebel groups and different universities to meet together to realise they're not alone, they're not crazy, they're right. And, and that, that, I think, has given the uh, heterodox economics movement legs that it never had before after a similar starting point well, it's nice to hear that i uh I, mm. I'll, I guess i'll give it a running start from my background i came from detroit michigan a place that did not believe in equilibrium economics because the place mm. was being smashed as i was growing up they talk mm. about diseases of despair and so forth my parents friends my dad was a physician and a jazz musician my mother worked with the detroit symphony but watching all the manufacturers reps and all these families just get trashed made me very anxious about economy and political economy. Mm. And I, I see them as unified. Then uh, I went to MIT and through uh, meeting Tom Ferguson, who was teaching about the transformation around the uh, time of William McKinley's presidency in the United States. He suggested that I look more into finance, and there was a guy down in another building 
named Charles Kindleberger. And I went over and I took Charlie's course as he was building manias, panics, and crashes. He convinced me to add economics as a second major. And I, I worked quite a bit with him. I was on the sailing team at the school and he was trying to write about how maritime technology affected the tensions that existed between the Dutch and the British empires different mm. nautical technologies and he wanted me to study that and i started thinking this economic stuff's pretty good but that what i'll call minsky-esque kindleberger kind of feeling set the stage i went and did a phd in economics at princeton and i met people uh at the institute for advanced studies uh through a man named axel leyenhofen who was there for a couple of years he told me Use your math, get through your general exams, but you can really get down to interesting things related to the Weimar Republic, David Abraham or Karl Shorsky or all kinds of tensions and learning about history and embedding economics and uh, Albert Hirschman obviously leading that help. So I ended up going on uh, through knowing Paul Volcker. I got a dissertation fellowship at the Fed. Paul was not an orthodox economist. He may have done things that had to do with stabilizing prices and so forth that were criticized on the left, but he he did he believed in what I'll call Knightian uncertainty or the kind of things Keynes and Frank Knight were writing about. Okay. So as I roll onto the deck uh, of what you might call having grown children, I left Washington D.C. I had worked at the as the chief economist of the United States Senate Banking Committee got a behind the door look at the real political economy of finance and financial regulation. And I came to Wall Street after a time at Bankers Trust. I joined the Soros Fund Management and was there uh, in 1992, was part of the currency team that did the so-called breaking of the British pound. But Soros had written a book in 1987. I met him at the time of the 87 stock market crash. He came down and talked to me about the hearings I was running. And his book was called The Alchemy of Finance, and it embodied yeah. the spirit of radical uncertainty. <clears throat> so as things like uh, the Levy Institute and others were coalescing, I became familiar before we met in person, Steve, with your name and your writing, and I could see that we were kindred spirits. We were, yeah. what I call, both horses pulling the same kind of cart. And uh, mm. I thought uh, when you, you came to us, I, I obviously worked in the context of Mr. Soros and he wanted people to get partial grants from us. So he felt like he got leverage. He was a great hedge fund manager. And uh, so if you got a grant from us and a grant for somebody else and you got your 250,000, we were getting, how you say, a bonus uh, from the leverage you right. created elsewhere. And, and that was that was a very conscious uh, sense that he had about what constituted grant making. I, I went a little different direction, which was things that I thought would never be funded. And I would say, Steve, maybe I uh, uh, conformed to some of his interest in leverages because I thought you were strong enough that you would get other money in addition to ours. And uh, so at that juncture, I, I think how they say we made a good bet. You've done excellent work and you've continued to maintain, I guess, as the world has gotten more, uh, how, I, I, you probably, no, I'll ask you this as a question. When we started INET, people said, uh oh, finance is off course. We got to restore, challenge the profession, get that back on track, restore confidence in governance, and restore confidence in expertise. Hmm. What's happened, whether it's related to inequality or climate or whatever, is that the belief in governance and expertise has continued to deteriorate, regardless hmm. of what uh, mea culpas were acknowledged in the realm of finance. So I, I think right now we're in a place where uh, people are quite terrified because they don't feel like we, we have a system or an ideology that's like a North Star or a guiding light to benefit us or future generations. And so I, I think that, how would I say, seeing you still being constructive about understanding and building the next phase of how things really are and therefore how they need to be structured, observed, regulated, enforced, et cetera, for the good of, for the common good 
is extremely valuable. I know you and I have been involved with Bill Hines at the NAOC yeah. and his uh, challenges recently. And um, I, I should call him William. I don't think he calls himself Bill. No, it's William, uh, yeah. But, yeah, but uh, there's, there are people in these various different walks of life. And I, I would say you're both rigorous, but you don't live behind the mask of playing with mathematical or statistical tools as though that gives you authority. You're, you're looking for the real way to see. And uh, I think that's how they say essential to the yeah, endeavor mate, the, the, that I embarked on as well. I'm delighted. I didn't know your background, oh. your academic background. Uh, so I'm delighted to hear that. And, uh, you know, you've, you've crossed, you, you had uh, people that I've crossed paths with at various times, part of your, um, your education and inspiration. So like, I've never met Kindleberger. I met Minsky once. Mm. <laughs> very difficult personality as it happens. Uh, I think people uh, were very well aware of that. Kindleberger, from what I understand, was quite charming. I'm not sure, but I, but yes, I have to yeah, have to say, Axel Leinhofer is a true <sighs> giant of a human being, and yes. I, I had the great pleasure of inviting Axel out to be the keynote speaker at one of the History of Economic Thought conferences in Sydney, and he came up with his wife, and of course you'd know the story. Axel is over two meters tall. His wife <laughs> is, is, is is about five foot. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, they're the hilarious couple on that basis. And Axel has got one of the greatest senses of humour of anybody I've ever met. Oh. He, had you, he just has you in hysterics all the time while giving you extremely deep insights at the same time. So, uh, Ty, I don't think you've actually... Uh, Ty and Daniel might not have read this yet, but I think one of the greatest papers in economics is one written by Axel called Life Among the Econ. Yes. And it's, it's yes. a satire where he... And Dan, you'd love this. He pretends to be an anthropologist who goes on a a, um, a sleigh trip into the <laughs> into the far north, into the the wastelands that are the home of the tribe of the Yekong, and talks about their rituals and their uh, uh, their, uh, their 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 models, their how it is to make a model, and their sex and how they don't get on with the sociologues and the philosophers or in their neighbouring tribes. So, mate, if you had Axel Leinhofer as a supervisor, or you know, I'm incredibly envious. Well, he was a delight, and I, I want to add something about him. Uh, he came and explored with me joining the board of what he called the Trento Summer School that he founded in Trento, mm -hmm. Italy. And we went up to the yeah. Dolomites. I had a young child. My daughter, Sarah, was under two years old, and uh, she's now 13. And we sat looking at these mountains with him telling the kind of jokes that just make you double over you know it's like the next day you say why my stomach hurts so much because you've been laughing all day <laughs> and he and his wife were, were with us yeah. for almost a week up there and we're hiking around and so forth and then uh he introduced me to the people at the trento economic festival uh, tito boriari and others mm. and we started working as partners with inet at the trento festival in the trento summer school we provided essentially INET speakers to then stay on for an extra 10 days and be the teachers in mm. very, you know, Nobel laureates like Joe Stiglitz and others. Axel had a board with Peter Howitt, um, Andy Haldane and a few others and myself. Mm. And he mm. would put this thing together. And th the young people, when he passed away, decided to name the school, the Axel Ray and Hooford School. And, yeah. and it continues to this day. And Michael Spence, Nobel laureate, just gave the wintertime speech, which was an outstanding speech about technology and economic development mm. that did not follow the orthodox box at all. I think mm. naming something after Axel gives you a certain freedom in in what you compose and present. But, yeah. uh, but he was a beacon and a delight. And by the way, from the onset in 2009, when I was holding what I call strategic meetings about what should this thing look like, I would mm. say that he and George Akerlof were among po possibly the two most leading visionaries about what was wrong and what to do about it. Yeah, but it people, really that don't, people that aren't familiar with Axel, I mean, uh, Axel Leinhofer, his main name is Lionhead in Swedish. 
and uh, that's just by the by. Okay, but he wrote. <laughs> he, he wrote. It, it, it suits him in many ways. So he's got a great mane as well. Had a great mane, uh, and uh, but he wrote a book called On Keynesian Economics and the Economics of Keynes, and that was. His, I mean, I, I I I read the book way way back when I was doing my my master's thesis, and it was influential. But what I saw him trying to do was to give a Keynesian uh, explanation for Keynesian thinking within a Volraisian framework. Uh, so it was he, he pushed he, he pushed and broke the envelope of mainstream economics more so yes. than Robert Cloward, who is his co-author. But they were still trying in that book to say, well, here's a way to understand Keynes from a, if you are a Volrasian, and that is to say that the Volrasian idea of complete markets and complete information and so on is not fulfilled in the real world, and therefore there'll be a def difference between effective demand and intended demand. And then that's what they used to explain Keynes. Uh, I, I didn't think that was the correct way to do it, but I think it was a way that communicated uh, Keynes and made him seem sensible to somebody coming from a Volrasian point of view. Well, the Volrasian think, well, you've got to be crazy. Of course, complete markets solve all these problems. And there are no yeah. complete markets was the was the point of the... Yeah. Uh, the, yeah. But he was... Uh, you're bringing something to the surface that's very important. You started with his sense of humor. Yeah. But he knew how to work. I mean, he was on the faculty at UCLA, which at the time was on the conservative side of the pendulum. It's, it mm. was more like a Chicago school than like uh, Cambridge, England. And yeah. he knew how to be with them and argue, as you said in the, in the book, starting from their logic and then building out. Mm. So mm. he could take them down the path. He didn't just refute them. He used his humor to attract them. He knew how to f foster debate and exploration without creating what I'll call repelling force fields that sent people away or to dismiss him. He was very artful, very gifted. Mm. I can't claim to have the same art, of course. I tend to do a bit of repelling in my own my own work, and I'm getting to the stage where I think that's the only way to go. But you know, Ax Axel, did a, a, I actually remember there was um, the, the uh, opening speech of the presidency of Robert Lucas uh, when he became president of the American Economic Association. And that was an extemporized speech. I recommend people read it. It's in the history of political economy. He gave the speech, I think it was the annual um, conference, the history of political economy. And he, uh, I, I use this quote all the time. He said that he, um, he just, he, people were talking when they arrived about Keynes and economics and the economics of Keynes. And they were making the point that Hicks hadn't properly understood Keynes. And, uh, but he said in the discussion, so this is also, of course, the point that, um, that not only Axel Leinhoff had made about Hicks, but Hicks made about Hicks. Hicks said he didn't know <laughs> later on. But anyway, so this was not something that was, uh, was Robert Lucas was aware of, which like a typical neoclassical, he hadn't read outside the envelope of mainstream economics. And so mm -hmm. in, the, in the speech, he said, um, we had a lot about, you know, like Leinhoff's book and, and this stuff and say Hicks didn't really understand Keynes. But I didn't hear much more talk about that today. So I'm going to hope that's uh, that's not correct because if it wasn't for Hicks, I wouldn't have understood. I, I approached my friend Gary Becker, another neoclassical, another Nobel Prize winner. I said to Gary, do you reckon that Hicks got Keynes right? And he said, well, I'm hoping him so because if it wasn't for Hicks, I wouldn't have made any sense at all out of that damn book, that damn book <laughs> being the general theory of employment, okay? Well, Hick, you know, as Leonhofer himself said very clearly later, and Hicks himself said, Hicks's book wasn't even written in reference to Keynes. It was a Volrasian model he invented in 1935. Yes. And this is to quote Hicks, before I read, before I, I wrote even the first of my papers on Keynes, he, the model was in his head, what's called ISLM. So ISLM, which is taken by the mainstream as the interpretation of Keynes, is a convenient little mathematical model, uh, was in fact a Volrasian model that had nothing to do with Keynes. And uh, and that's the sort of profession we live in. It's, I often say economics are like, this, like a game of Chinese whispers, uh, which has also been disturbed by, by a, uh, a tornado. And you try to put together the history, you've got to go right back to see where things came from, to have any idea of why we're in the mess we are in now. And I think in many ways, Rob, I'd say the mess is, the, the mess is worse now, I'd say, than back before the financial crisis. Yes. Well, I think there are a lot of dim dimensions that are quite severe about what was missing. I often ask people, 
why do you think this economic system is what I'll call morally justified? They said, well, it's embedded in a democracy. And I said, okay, but what do you do when you have too many markets? They look at me, kind of scratch their head. What, what does that mean? I said, when you have a market for survival as a politician, meaning campaign contributions, mm. when you have a market for the media who have to, what I'll call, filter what they carry based on who pays their advertising mm. and when you have a market for experts based on the endowments of universities that means large concentrations of money can decide what is considered legitimate what we explore what mm. we legislate for what we enforce and so why do you think that that system that broader political economic general equilibrium makes any sense at all in terms of mm what am I called moral justification. It feels to me like we created a fantasy market system. And uh, how would I say, I, I think the side effects of that are, are very profound. Mm, when that's, in that's the context of climate change, why is, aren't we moving faster? I made a podcast on my series with Gus Beth, who has worked in administrations on climate, going back to Jimmy Carter. They know what's there. They declare something. They don't do anything. Well, I, I, his, I'll, I'll be short here, but his perspectives were the fossil fuel industry knows how to play defense. And people who saw places like Detroit and Cleveland get smashed, who now live in West Virginia, say, well, it may be better for the world, but America is not going to take care of me with transformational assistance. So the resistance mm. becomes formidable, and we all, what you might call, deepen the void and get into a more dangerous place. I mm. I want to want to jump in here, and uh, there's this this comment from Murphy, and uh, it's there's too many interesting, important areas of expertise in the world, and how do people even choose? Um, Steve, what do you? I mean, what's your intuition on that? That's a very vague sort of uh, question. Yeah, I'm but, the, the, we, we, we live in a world where we have to rely upon specialists. Okay, uh, Human society is so complex that we have to trust specialists. And that uh, works extremely well when you have the industries like uh, specializations like engineering and physics, uh, where the knowledge has been tested both uh, by the scientific method and by uh, real world um, exercises with the scientific method. Economics came out of, a, if you see where neoclassical economics originated, why it became dominant, it, 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 was, a, it was a backwater uh, under, in the period of the classical economists. You look at uh, a David, a David Ricardo and Adam Smith, particularly Ricardo, uh, Ricardo was dismissive of the idea that you should base economic on the concept of scarcity. He wrote that there are several classes of products that are produced. There are scarce products which cannot be reproduced easily and the price of those will be determined by the preferences of the buyer. But the, the product we're talking about in economics are the objects which can be expanded without limit if you're willing to put the labor and material to produce them. So they dismissed the whole neoclassical foundation and people like Jean Baptiste Say and also Augustine Corneau, who were the early like proto neoclassicals, they were the outsiders. Now Marx came along, used the classical school as a weapon against uh, uh, capitalism by saying the capitalist effectively saying they're more sophisticated than this but because labor was the source of all value then labor deserved to get all the output that's marx wasn't that simplistic but he he made a stronger measure of, the, of that with that, in, that in, in, implication and that was in the 1860s when uh, das capital came out and within a few years neoclassical economics the idea that utility scarcity determines value that utility is the object of capitalism that uh the need of labor labor doesn't produce that labor and capital together produce the physical goods we consume and the utility we consume that pushed the classical school out completely and i think what we had from that point on was an ideology disguised it, it was well-meaning when if you wrote this stuff back in the 1870s there was a reason to believe you could put a model together that made sense with utility maximizing consumers on one side, profit maximizing firms on the other. Uh, but it, it, it fell into the trap of describing a perfect society, which happened to be the one we're living in. And that, that perspective 
became ingrained in the heads of economists when they learned the, the vision of neoclassical economics. It's a beautiful model. The world works perfectly. There's no power. You were talking about power a while ago, Rob, in many ways. But what the neoclassical system tells you is, well, enough markets and dispersed individuals and no concentrations, uh, you'll get a perfect system leading us to general equilibrium, and isn't that a wonderful place to be? And this sense of ideology got buried in mainstream economics. And when uh, after in the 1870s, you could make these various presumptions about how this approach to economics would work without knowing whether it actually did at the very, very deep level, uh, the mathematics, when you go very deeply into it. Then, of course, in the 20th century, people started going deeply into that mathematics and it contradicted the various requirements of the neoclassical theory. So, for example, Volra's uh, tautonement process was shown to be mathematically unstable. It would not reach equilibrium. Uh, the demand curve derivation was shown to be impossible uh, with individuals having downward sloping demand curves, what's called the sonnenschein mantle de Groot theorem proved that you couldn't derive a downward sloping market demand curve from that. And now what the response of neoclassical economists was to say, oh, let's assume representative agent, okay? So that, that was a failure that took over uh, the demand theory. Let's assume that there are individual uh, rates of profit. There's no convergence rate. That was the arrow de Broer theorem. So what you had was the economics retreating into this, by making, by, by having fundamental failures, those failures defined the discipline. And they then embraced those failures in a sense as being the way the economics should develop. And you had this, totally highly technical highly mathematical but completely delusional foundations for economics which took over and that's why i mean the advantage was there for soros mm -hmm. to take advantage of in terms of finance markets behaving completely different to what the medigliani miller theorem says uh, and you had the frustration that drove people like me to say look this is a fantasy uh, this is not the real world this is you know i'm, I'm quoting queen here um but but that became the the economics that we all protested against and i think what the experience with inet and you know the, the fact that i'm still fighting against the mainstream show i think economics is incapable of reforming itself and the thing which i appreciate about inet is that you've made by f financing young students who have the same reactions that i did letting them learn the literature as well uh you've maintained the, the pressure of criticism on this discipline that I don't think it'll ever live up to, but thank God the pressure is there. Well, I think it's important to have that pressure in part because as the Young Scholars Initiative has taught me, many assistant professors who can see the world in trouble or in danger or in pain, hmm. understand that their vocation, their calling in life should be to address these things with their expertise. But when they're made to conform to the fantasy, they can't yeah. fulfill that mission. And there's very high incidence of mental illness and diseases related to mental illness among assistant professors in economics these days, according to my young scholars who have studied mm -hmm. this through medical science. Other things that I would bring to bear, you, I remember Paul Davidson at uh, Rutgers University teaching me. Uh, I was at Princeton, but I snuck down and listened to his lectures. And he talked about ergodic stability. Mm. When you take that Valrhesian model you described, it's not only like you go to the fruit market today and say, I got $10, do I buy apples, oranges, grapefruits, or whatever, and add it up to $10. Mm. You're thinking about today and tomorrow and years in the future. And you don't know without stability of statistical distributions and so forth, what mm. the future looks like. The future is not only unknown, but it's unknowable. Yeah. So the whole notion of intertemporal efficiency and everything the government does mm. is uh, a, a source of inefficiency and waste. Leave the wisdom of the market to itself is nonsense because mm. they don't know. They pretend they know to keep the regulators off their back, but they also employ the political economy I mentioned by going in what you might call manufacturing a security basket which we will call a bailout for themselves if they make a yeah. mess now what happens yeah. i call it the mother of all moral hazards when you know that you control the political economy 
and you can get bailed out, what do you do? First of all, mm -hmm. your funding cost comes down because nobody thinks you're going to go bankrupt. So there's no default risk premium. That mm -hmm. gives you advantage over smaller institutions because you, you got to be too big to fail. Second, when the interest rate comes down, you take bigger positions and the bailouts get bigger. And then what happens when it blows up, like the great financial crisis? Go to David Sirota and Alex Gibney's uh, audible multi-part podcast series. It's called yeah. Meltdown. It's not about mm -hmm. the meltdown of the financial markets. It's about the meltdown of the faith in governance in America following the bailouts where, as Joe Stiglitz famously said, the polluters got paid and the rest of us suffered. So mm. you have all mm. kinds of these dimensions which are very, very, very stressful for young scholars not to address mm. when they see the pain, when they see the suffering. I just did a podcast with this gentleman, Max Lawson, and his colleague from uh, Oxfam, where they talked about how trillions of dollars of wealth was created during the pandemic and over 90% of it went to the top one half percent of the already wealthy. Mm. And we don't have a wealth tax to pay for vaccination systems of, of the whole planet. People start abandoning belief that humankind is being, which you might call uh, facilitated. And then they ask me, what's wrong with economists? I said, well, economist model you is responding to financial incentives, but they model themselves as working for the global public good. If they model yes. themselves under the same incentive structures, then their desire for consulting, their desire for big prestigious chairs or big government appointments would teach you that their judgment isn't for the global common good, it's for their own well-being, or at least in part, not everybody's totally greedy, mm. but, but how does expertise maintain its integrity in the force field of economics when the economists study people and say they abide by those force fields and they don't have integrity. Final piece I'll add to this, I think it's very important, and I'm happy to say this, a young scholar named Robert Akalov. His mother is Janet Yellen, father is George Akerlof, the Nobel laureate who I mentioned. He's mm. writing his work, his dissertation and beyond now published work, he's at University of Warwick, about how preferences, the desires of people, are not formed in isolation mm. and locked in. That, In other words, preferences and desires are the result of social outcomes of the market the parable is you take your preferences that forms a demand function, you fire it into the market, and the market serves you. And it serves society by creating a balance. <clears throat> but what happens if the society's uh, you might have outcomes produce a great deal of fear? Your preferences change. As somebody said to me, you don't st study Dante and Homer and Shakespeare as an undergraduate. You study accounting and business administration. Not because it's more interesting, because you're afraid you won't survive unless you learn those skills. Mm -hmm. And Robert Akerlof is basically breaking the foundations of what I'll call normative welfare economics by exploring what if preferences are endogenous and reactive to the kind of outcomes we see. So this is this is a great conversation. I want to just remind everybody to hit the like button um, and make some comments underneath the video. So not just in the chat, but we just want to bump this video up on the algorithm. So any uh, comments about the show itself, any improvements we can do is greatly appreciated. If you're on Twitter, make sure you hit the like button and retweet Daniel. What kind of questions do you have right now? Because I can see it in your eyes and I want to put <laughs> you on the spot. I would love to. I mean, but this was like watching uh, Steve and Rob have this. I, I mean, I wanted to stand back and watch. It's a pleasure to watch this. Well, like I'll, um, I'll, I'll carry on on that on that point of the like, Dan, because um, I think that the what, what we've had with uh, neoclassical economics is Something which I think was the, I think I think it was Henry mentioned the great English the great American satirist, and uh, who just said that to every human problem there's a there's a solution which a simple solution which is neat plausible and wrong, and I think the, the great <laughs> danger of economics 
the great danger of economics is that it's neat, it's plausible, and it's wrong. But the people who got into it, the neat and plausible is what they get addicted to. And they're therefore very resistant and very aggressive about any attempt to say, well, look, your neat, plausible idea is wrong. And and economics, I think, is... I've seen people say, like, uh, all of academia, in the comments here, uh, that they're endemic in academia. But I think the difference with ac economics in the sense of academia is that when there's a, a anomaly in a paradigm in a, in a genuine science, the anomaly can be reproduced by the students at any point in time, and they're aware of the anomaly. Now, the teachers themselves, and this is typical of not just economists who are guilty of this, you 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 become wedded to your paradigm. Okay? Uh, Popper's idea that we are wedded to data, where you try to and we try to come up with great conjectures which we then contradict is simply wrong about how people behave. Even Popper himself, I don't know if you've seen this, Rob, but, uh, you know, when when when, um, uh, when Kuhn wrote The Structure of Scientific Revolutions, he began as a Popperian, and he then tried to apply Popper's ideas about conjectures and refutations and, and science emerging out of myth to the development of astronomy. And uh, when he looked back mm. and tried to look at the work of the Ptolemaic astronomers, it was, in, if you know what, it, 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 to, do, to be a Ptolemaic astronomer, you had to... First of all, accept a paradigm that had the Earth as the center of the universe, but it couldn't be the center of the universe because the Earth is the place of decay, whereas the, the universe is the place of heaven and perfection. And, uh, and therefore, uh, Earth was slightly off center because it was right at the end. It'd be perfect. So it's slightly off center. I've forgotten what they called that. I think that's called deferent. And then they had, as they're taking from Aristotle's idea, that all the the planets and the moons and stars and sun rotated around around the earth on perfectly circular spheres perfectly concentric spheres that explained the rotation that we saw in the universe but of course that didn't suit the planets the planets reverse direction that means what well, planet means wanderer in greek so ptolemy came along and said well on these spheres there are other spheres that rotate and the planets are on those rotating spheres and then that explains why the planets reverse direction while still saying that the Earth is a, almost the center of a perfect universe, uh, where the, the, that, this explains the old mechanics. Now, that was a neat and plausible and completely wrong model of the universe. <laughs> but if you fiddled with where, where the deferent was and, and, and what rotation speed the, 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 uh, the, the large cycles had and what, how, how fast the epicycle cycled and so on, you could work out a really, really good model. And they actually called it. This is a fact. They actually called them dynamic stochastic general equilibrium models. <laughs> That's right. I, I I, just to add, uh, add a little flavor here. I want to encourage people to look at some people, uh, at some work that has been done historically. What I was talking about in this last little bit was the context in which things are happening is also a context in which power relationships and structures are, are part of the panorama or the idea. And so when people are arguing about things, they're not only arguing about what they observe, but they're arguing in the context of how they will be treated for how they argue. A beautiful book by a woman uh, from the West Coast of the United States, Mary Ferner, F-U-R-N-E-R, -E Advocacy Versus Objectivity, explores this and explores how in the aftermath of Marx what I'll call institutional economics was replaced by this, what I'll call pristine mathematical models that are disembodied from any human context. It's, it's math and symbols. Another example is in 1922, the gadfly in Baltimore, H.L. Mencken, wrote a fabulous article mm -hmm. called The Dismal Science. And I'll ask you to read it. The punchline, in essence, is... Mencken says the only people he trusts less than theologians are economists because of the way they see the consequences for what they say vis-a-vis -vis your committees, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but even Thorstein Veblen wrote books about the university. And when we start to understand institutions where ideas are brought, uh, uh, my friend of mine, Jerry Heron at Wayne State in Detroit, the universities and the myth of cultural decline. This was right at the onset of racism 
and the backlash against universities that were looking for something which might call more textured and supple than straight free market economics. So there, there's a lot of, of clues out there, meaning very illuminating writing about this human dynamic that follows along with what you might call the mechanical modeling culture. Mm. And uh, the, the, the thing is, it's so many, like we've got one and a half centuries now of criticism of economics and the neoclassical uh, juggernaut rolls on. I think probably the, uh, if I, I'm trying to remember the, it was J.B. Hobson, Confessions of an Economic Heretic. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm, I think Hobson was in the 19th century. That may be one of the earliest criticisms yes. from, within, from within economics. So Marx was a huge critic of the, uh, of classical school, but very much rubbish, say, which is the proto neoclassical. But even mm -hmm. after they become dominant, there's been protests all the way through. So Hobson, Veblen, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. A century later, they're still dominant. A century mm -hmm. later, I, I, I think the original founders, if they could come back and see what the economics has turned into, they'd be absolutely horrified. Uh, but it, the juggernaut keeps on rolling. And my feeling is it's largely because it feeds into this desire for humanity has for a perfect system. Humans are always, you know, th this is my, you know, it's where you walk past a Scientology centre, you're likely to be dragged into here, their idea of perfection, uh, a church, anything like that at all. And economics is heavily influenced by the same thing because it, it describes a perfect mechanism. And that is so seductive to people who've been trained into it that even after a crisis like the financial crisis, uh, some people come out and you know, join YSI and say, you know, it's crazy, this is unrealistic, we need a realistic economics. But there's enough people who'll be seduced by the vision of a perfect system to replace the professors who taught the previous stuff, and you'll get an even more refined version of the absurdities of neoclassical economics coming out after a crisis. So I've given up on universities yeah. as a possible place to reform economics from. I had a uh, very intense discussion a university professor who I won't name, who was ranting and raving. It was in the state of Michigan where I grew up. And he was ranting mm. and raving about Donald Trump. And he said mm. he's providing all these, uh, he's stirring the drink and he's providing all these false solutions, etc. And I said to him, when you negotiate the waters of financial markets and you teach your students about efficient markets, not just as dogmatic as Donald Trump. You're acting like a scientist. You're acting like you're dispassionate. Mm. But what mm. you're doing is you're appealing to their anxiety. I grew up with a mother who'd come from Scotland. Which her family was traumatized by the Great Depression. I grew up mm. thinking financial markets were a haunted house. So you have people with that kind of anxiety. They want to be reassured. And what happens mm. Is a, a false god can reassure you and make you feel better and enthusiastic mm. until they are unmasked that their, which you might call palliative or their solution, <clears throat> was not a basis for alleviating your anxiety. And when they're outed, then people resent them. But th this guy, acting like Trump, is a dogmatist who's attracting people. And I'm telling the truth. And I just, yeah. I, just I wanted to, I wanted to compare them to them. And, yeah, that, that's, that's, they, they really do believe they're telling. I mean, they've actually got to say there's, there's one guy that I interact with in London quite a bit called John, John Hearn. He's on Twitter. And John is an extremely nice guy. I'm very, very fond of him. Even before I met him, I felt like, even though I think what he's saying is absolute nonsense, I really like him as a human being. And he has swallowed the whole first year economics textbook. He teaches at one of the universities there. And it's all about how the markets reach equilibrium and the competition, blah, blah, blah. And I, I, I try to get through to him. This is a completely unrealistic description of capitalism. So all the empirical data that you think parallels your theory of market is completely false. You know, firms do not have rising marginal cost. They have falling marginal cost. You can't even get your supply curve out, et cetera, et cetera. But he has such faith in this vision. And and, and that's what I think is why it's so seductive. It, it gives you faith in a complex world. And what you and I are offering is say, well, the world is complex. Faith, faith won't, won't 
won't cut it. We need to understand. We need to have the logic and 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 uh, correctly describe the system. We have any chance to reform it. Um, but no, no, they've got their myths, and 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 the myths are very comforting. And I hadn't thought about the emotion. I, I do a bit think about it, but you, you you put it very well. The emotional side that 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 gives them a a way of feeling safe in a in a complex and unstable system. They feel safe mm -hmm. with the vision of that being a simple and you know equilibrium system. And it's so hard. To I think the other it side of this, the other side of this pendulum that's also very important is if you go back and you study the crisis from the past, whether Greek or Roman or the onset of World War One or World War Two, or even Stalinism or Maoism, the unfettered faith that if you take it away from it and give it to the government, it will do things is also that's uh, also quite yeah. dangerous. Yeah, yeah. And, and, I mean, so that, that's it, the, it, and that yeah. leaves us in what you might call the fog of an unresolvable gray area where we have to bear that anxiety. And when you and I, guy, and guys like you and I talk, are we illuminating this, when you say, unknowable environment, or are we making people despair more and more susceptible to authority? alternatives. In other words, we can't keep yeah. deepening the void. We've got to figure out how to fill the void or find a healthy North Star to which we can all, how do you say, navigate towards. It's it's very, very treacherous. And, uh, yeah. But, but I, 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 I'm a doctor's son. You start with a proper diagnosis before you can prescribe a remedy. And the kind of work that you do, Steve, is very, very lucid. Thank you. Diagnosis about what the real problems are. But you're right, quite right. Then that gets you caught in the dilemma of, like, I'm obviously, if I say the government has to be part of the system. So if you remember that, now I'm becoming ancient now paper that, you know, Tom Ferguson, one of the referees for, for my paper on uh, modeling Vinsky's financial instability hypothesis. Um, that so the government plays it a critical role of stabilizing an unstable system. Uh, but that means, therefore, you can be seen from the, the point of view of neoclassicals, you're proposing an authoritarian solution. And this, we have this thing between the freedom of the market and the authoritarianness of the government. And what you and I are saying, and it's a common thing amongst non-orthodox economists, is we need a yin and the yang of the two. But that's an incredibly difficult balancing act. Whereas what we get when you get the... the, the Card, you know, what I call cardboard cutout marks of Marxists who believe the labor theory of value. They go straight to the authoritarian no markets end. And then you have the libertarian neoclassicals who are just as deluded as the extreme Marxists with a different philosophy. And they say we should have absolutely no government. You know, Milton Friedman type, uh, Milton Friedman's son even worse than Milton Friedman about the world works better without <laughs> government. It's all So, so we, we're saying no, it's a combination of the two. But then it becomes an incredibly hard judgment call. What should be government? What should be private? What are the various roles? And then that means you've yes. got to be comfortable in an uncertain environment. And to some extent, people like you and I, we are comfortable. It's still difficult. But there are a lot of people, the neoclassicals or the or the, the people who go extreme labor theory of value Marxism, they're, they're looking for the, what, the one right solution. And it doesn't involve judgment. Just, you know, Get rid of the get rid of the government. Neoclassicals say it work well. Get rid of the market. Marxists say it work well. Uh -uh. Both are wrong. But... Guys, I want to I want to book in question this a little bit. Because... I want to ask you. I want to quickly ask you. When you get rid of the government, do you also get rid of law enforcement? Because then it's chaos. I'm yeah, watching I'm at, and yeah. reading books like Douglas Rushkoff's book Survival of the Richest, which is about all kinds of billionaires building their own bomb shelters and wanting to hire ex-Navy SEALs to protect their farmland. And so, there, in other words, we promote a false ideology. The system mm -hmm. becomes unstable. It becomes even dangerous physically for the successful. And if you, quote, abandon government, you're abandoning law enforcement. And yeah. the wealthy are so scared they don't know how to get out of the corner other than thinking about building bomb shelters, uh, according to Rushkoff. And I think, that, yeah. I think, in other words, uh, Martin Wolf's just written a very interesting book called The Crisis of Economic Democracy. And it's about if you don't do things that could create sustainable social balance, you do have occurrences like fascism and world war and potentially nuclear wars. 
And people who say, well, nuclear war, everybody knows that's no good. But when you can't solve the problems in your economy, there's a called the Bismarck model. Pick a foreign enemy and unite the population behind you against that foreign enemy enemy so they stop fighting in the divisiveness domestically about all the differences between them and i mm. i see a little bit of that now in the in the china i'm not excusing china or russia at all but seeing this kind of vigorous nationalism as a way of redirecting our attention from the fact that we're not handling the what you might call unsustainable trajectories within our societies mm. and that's that's that we've even seen that the balloon issue that's coming up right now you know it's they're, they're shooting down balloons and the chinese and <laughs> balloons <out right. laughs> and at the same time did the, did the russia did the americans or the russians uh, blow up no, the nord stream and it, you know it, it is and, and even Putin's invasion is like a return to the 19th century. And, not, and I, I know I know the extent to which Russia, America was provoking Russia for the last 30 years. And I've been, you know, I've written about the Russian defeat of economic orthodoxy myself. But Putin's move there is like a return to 19th century colonialism as well. And yeah, it, it, in fact, it feels a bit like Brave New World. Fighting to... You know, you have the two two countries, and the third one's in the outer, and then you rotate who's who's which alliance. So it it's I'm finding it very depressing, frankly. Rob, I don't know how you cope with um, having a you know a progressive and, and, and ethical mind in the middle of all this, but to see the chaos that the world is in at the moment is uh, very depressing. About having a sense of humanity's capacity to. To actually develop that you know stable system we all mythologize about and we we don't live in but uh you know i just i just i see more chaos coming our way and it's partic particularly depressing the older i get well i guess the, the, you asked how how do i stay on the mission i yeah. wake up in the morning and i look at my fourth children and three grandchildren and i feel a sense of duty and that's more than money that's more than prestige or awards or anything I, uh, that's 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 the core of my what i'll call perseverance in this realm and i see the young students so i don't have any kids of my own but i see the young yeah. students and think i i don't yeah. want them to go through the same you know difficult process of understanding what was wrong with mainstream yeah. economics and what's what's difficult about our society that i went through so try to make it easier yeah. for the next it doesn't generation doesn't have to be my, my, my biological family tree yeah You're right Young yeah. scholars, young people in my <laughs> neighborhood. It, they're, it, yeah. it, we're playing for the future right yeah. now. That's All right. What I love about this so, podcast is how upbeat it is. Yeah, good. Let's Sorry let's uh, let's hold these uh, thoughts. We're going to carry on into the second half. I know Rob can stay with us for a little bit um, before he has to go, and hopefully Steve can stay for a few yep. minutes because because I want to keep uh, Rob and Steve talking here. What I'm going to do in the second half is kind of do a little segment on building models in Minsky. We're going to do yeah. that each week. But I want the conversation between Rob and Steve to carry on as I'm building the model on screen. So you guys keep talking, doing your thing. Um, mm -hmm. Guys, uh, watching uh, the show, um, we're going to do a quick cut scene here. But we want you to stay with us live. Keep chatting on the side. We're just going to go through this. And the reason why we're doing this is in the future, if we want to chop these two sections up, into two separate pieces we can so we're doing a cut scene here so stay with us we'll be right back and, uh, we did it again now as i said our last show was cancelled after you appeared on it so fingers crossed the executives don't do that again the more i read in the neoclassical thing the more i, I just you know my scratching my eyeball out all the time i'm okay. the voice of god in the background oh geez <laughs> once the coins get uh warm enough because of your body temperature in the winter it actually keeps you <laughs> moderate beer drinking in the evenings well that's inspiring yeah. for a saturday morning
See, Whoa. we're we're still friends after the show, and that's the <laughs> no, most actually. I've, I've, I've got a little Rob, Rob doesn't have this piece of background here because, like you, you and I've known each other for some years, Rob. Um, but Daniel, uh, Daniel approached me. What about two years ago? Was it Dan? You wanted to start yeah. a video, a vid okay, so we're doing a vidcast, and just like we have here in this one, Rob, we had comments down the side. And a bit of background this is where after the pandemic it began, and I uh, realized that I could use Minsky to model the pandemic by taking advantage of the godly tables. Uh, the uh, godly table has exclusive categories, so you have if you transfer money from uh, the savers account to the borrower's account then there's a minus in the savers and a plus in the borrowers, that sort of thing. That's all run to handle monetary modeling, but it would work for exclusive categories. And therefore, in, when you look at modeling a pandemic, there is a range of models you may be aware of called the SEARD models, which stand for susceptible, exposed, infected, recovered, dead. So I made a simple five, five uh, system states in a godly table using those, and then use Minsky to model the godly tables. And I put that up on my, on my, um, my uh blog my, my patreon blog anyway um that that's by that was by the by but uh then there was a comment in one of the comments from the guy saying oh i've built a seared model in minsky would you like to see it and i simply replied oh yeah sure why not send it to me and it happened it was the person who said it was ty Keynes. okay now i i my model had five system states so it was susceptible it's, it's it, it, it's you know you, you you may or may not get the disease infected you have got the disease uh exposed rather you've been exposed to the disease infected you actually catch it recovered you survive dead you die okay five elements to it so i said uh motai's model to me and all i see is the file name you know i load the file to minsky and my reaction and i quote was fuck a duck it, <laughs> yeah. had 20, it had 25 system states. It was absolutely intricate and it was absolutely beautiful. Uh, truly superb model of the pandemic. Uh, he even, like, there's no, there are no stochastic elements to Minsky as yet. So you can't actually get, um, uh, what do you call it, um, uh, you know, randomness turning up in the system. But what Ty had done is used two instances of the Lorenz function and sampling them to, to simulate uh, uh, randomness in the model. Absolutely brilliant stuff. So that's where Ty and I met. And uh, it's been a very fruitful uh, collaboration ever since. And I'm, what Ty's showing you now is, is uh, Minsky as, as it is these days. He's actually typing up the susceptible one as we talk. Um, and um, uh, that, that, it looks like you're using an old version of, is that the new version? Uh, uh, well, that, is that it's actually the newest beta version, beta 27 of 3.0. Oh, okay. That's, you're using Ravel, Ravel for that. Okay, good. Just I couldn't tell from the background. You've, you've made the background color gray, which looks a bit like the old one. Yeah, I, I kind of like the gray a little bit better. It's easier on the eyes versus the white, which is the, yeah. the default version for the JavaScript. So yeah. I, I, it, like, I, in many things in life, I get stuck in, in the old ways. So I've used the the uh, TLC or TCL version for so many years now. I got used to that gray ba background, and I I can't have okay. it any other way. And fortunately, uh, with the new JavaScript version, you can <coughs> modify you can modify the background any way you like. So that's what I've okay, done. Okay. So keep on going, Ty. You, uh, Rob, and I'll chat as you do it. But you yeah. can see what the, the, the godly tables were designed for financial flows. That was the unique thing about Minsky. But here's Sai rapidly putting together a model of the uh, pandemic. And you, what you have is you, if you, what, what takes you out of being susceptible and makes you infected, one is a negative and the other is a positive. And that means the godly table works beautifully. So if you want to do this with, with raw differential equations, you'd be writing really quite complicated differential equations and very, very hard to do. And here it's a breeze. You just actually say, well, you go from infected to recovered, and there are the equations that are being built for you as you write them in Minsky. So it, it's showing that even though we designed it for, for monetary modeling, it's incredibly powerful as a, as a tool for general system dynamics as well. So, and uh, yeah, so I'll let, let Ty, Ty continue fiddling. Have you played with Minsky at all, Rob? Not since uh, the time of your proposal, where you, okay. I think you were one of your friends, took me through a, 
um, yeah. kind of a simulation or an overview. I, I was more a spectator yeah. than actual hands-on, but I remember learning yeah. about it at that time. Yeah, yeah. Well, what uh, what uh, Ty has shown is incredibly sophisticated models can be built now in Minsk. Mm -hmm. It's still, we, we were very lucky. I, you, you guys, you know, giving me the initial funding was extremely important. I then ran a Kickstarter campaign that raised about, like you gave me 128,000 US dollars. I raised about 100,000 from a Kickstarter campaign when I was, uh, when the University of Western Sydney shut down my economics department so I could no longer get government funding. And then after that, I was, uh, this, this comes back to William Hines, our, our great friend William in the OECD. Uh, mm -hmm. One of the friends of, friends of NAIC meetings was being shared by a man, I've forgotten who it was now, but he came up to me and said, I'm, from the, I'm the chairman of Friends Provident and we would like you to apply for us for funding. So I did, and they gave me a, um, about a, another 200,000 pounds of funding. And that's really wow. built Minsky to the state that it's at now. So the total funding is only about half a million US dollars, but it's now, and uh, I think it's now competitive with the uh, system dynamics models that are listed for 30 or 40 years, things like Ben Sim and Stellar and so on. There are some things mm -hmm. it doesn't do that they that they do do, but in terms of the sophistication of models you can build, uh, Minsky is now up there and is now becoming competitive in that overall market. So, uh, well, bravo. Yeah. So yeah, you've done you've done us a great favour. Well, you, you gave us the leverage we were looking for. Thank you, man. Indeed, definitely come out of it. So, uh, I want to prompt yeah. so that in case in just sec, I so in case that that Rob and and Steve don't get a chance to to discuss putting another date on the calendar. Um, I think, uh, Rob, we talked about uh, having Steve on your show. So yep. um, yeah, yeah, I'd like to see that happen too, right? Mm. Very much, so, very much. With that you. Be, that's that's be a the couple of weeks. I have to, I'm going to India tomorrow and uh, yeah. exploring a number of things there. And then I come back and run a board meeting, but by the uh, basically early April, I think, uh, we could schedule something and that'd be good on, for sure yeah Thanks. i've actually been working a lot on climate change recently rob have you seen any of my work on that front little bits but not uh yeah I, i've just been running thin right now so yeah um, i'm i'm horror i'm horrified by how badly neoclassicals have done climate change this is william mm. nordhouse uh, mm -hmm. in particular so i'm trying mm -hmm. to because Steve, I, can I actually I, think can i play yeah? something i i really yeah. want to play something hold on a sec Okay. You got to play um, something. Yeah. A pl play something. Hold on. Hold on a second here. Okay. Another. If you got it, we're just just you're running and running playing a clip, are you? Yeah, it's the well, old, the normal <laughs> day. Capitalism can survive anything. Hit us with a meteor in less than 65 million years, we'll be back up there again, and there'll only be a minor impact on the economy. Um, and I'm, I wish I was being facetious. We've actually we just we just worked out that if you hit dice with damages, the total 99.25 percent of GDP at some point in the overall trajectory, uh, at the end of the simulation run, which is in 500 years, and I said to very modest, it only tries to estimate the next half millennia. Um, the GDP is about 10% lower. That I call uh, fantasies about the impact of climate change, empirical estimates. And then there's construction of the model itself. And the construction of the model itself, uh, yeah, I mainly blame on neoclassical economics in general, but I reserve some special criticism for Nordhaus as well on how it's used the mainstream uh, standard. You guys are well, I mean, what I'm focusing on that he actually argues four degrees is optimal. That's and six degrees would only cause uh, GDP to fall by 8.5% in 
compared to what it would be in the complete absence of climate change. Now I think that's delusional, dangerous, negligent of the, and in terms of the, negligent of the existence of life on Earth, frankly. It is nothing, nothing tiny about this. Uh, because when you look at what scientists say that what would happen with the six degree Celsius, which is roughly about 10 degrees Fahrenheit, increase in the average temperature of the planet, fundamentally they're saying that would be an extinction event on the scale of the meteor that hit the dinosaurs. We're not talking eight and a half percent of GDP loss. We're talking, if we're lucky, eight and a half percent of GDP left. And I think that I think that would be an overestimate. So it's, it's mainly uh, utterly trivialising the dangers of climate change. Yeah, that, that's pretty much summarising what I've done, Rob. And I'm working with Carbon Tracker now, and hopefully a report will come out on that mm -hmm. front in about uh, four weeks' time. And the basic idea is we can use the finance sector's fiduciary duty towards the people who have you know, pensions and so on to say you can no longer use what the economists have done on climate change because it is fundamentally wrong. And it, it really is the worst work I've read in the whole 50 years that I've been a critic of mainstream economics. Uh, wow, that's a, that's quite an indictment. <laughs> the, uh, um, I, there's a gentleman, I think, at the Potsdam Institute. His name is Rothman, yeah. who's doing some very interesting work. Uh, I know there was a re recent uh, film that he made about the seven or nine characteristics uh, it, that it, it's not just about global warming, it's about water use and other things. Yeah. It was, uh, I think uh, David Attenborough, who's made a lot of films about oceans and climate and so forth, this is late in his career, he kind of is, is the MC behind it. I, I, somebody showed it to me on Netflix, but it, it feels like there, there's a group that I participated in called Practical Utopias. That was okay. a, a Canadian-sponsored group uh, that uh, Margaret Atwood, the famous novelist, started. And uh, they had some very interesting ways of seeing how to approach this that, which you might call, got, got more into the institutional economics of all the various aspects, whether mm. it's meat production or forests or water or whatever, and how the, they all interact with each other. So yeah. uh, I, I, I guess I've been pursuing different paths than uh, what I've seen in economic modeling is, as you know, anybody who uses a big enough discount rate can throw away the future. And uh, the funny just, thing uh, is, that, that, that's that's what I thought Nordhaus has done when I first went to read the literature. In fact, I was writing, uh, Owen Mount Sondorello wrote that to me, so he was finally used to a higher discount rate. But it turns out the discount rate is just there so that they can ignore what happens after 2300. Because it said, if you, when Nordhaus criticized um, Stern's market, what had a low discount rate, he said, well, if you have a low discount rate, then damages. Uh, in two or three hundred years, overwhelm the, and this is the, the important point, the relatively small damages in the next two centuries. So what, what he has said is that four <laughs> degrees, six degrees of warming only call a small amount of damage. And this is what's, it's what's driving scientists crazy because they are saying, like, you know, anything over two degrees, we risk tr triggering so many tipping points that the, the climate will be completely out of control. We will not be able to find Ooh. the force come back. So the, the scientists are saying to the, to the politicians, don't let us exceed two for God's sake. 1.5 even might be too much. But the, the politicians are listening to the economists are saying six degrees is fine. Mm -hmm. And I really, I'm, I'm, I really do think neoclassical economists are going to end up destroying capitalism. Mm. Well, the poem uh, that I mentioned, I just looked up, it's called Breaking Boundaries, the Science of Our Planet. And, okay. uh, when you said, uh, how would I say, it, what feels to me like the real danger is that when despair increases, anybody adhering to any rules other than their personal survival just tears apart all the collaborative dimensions of the system. And if economics is what you might call asleep at the wheel for so long that that's just allowed to explode, as I mentioned in our earlier conversation, you either have really violent law enforcement, which is a certain dysfunction of its own, or chaos. And uh, I, I just, I feel like, as Gus Speth said, we're, we got to get ahead of this curve, and we haven't done it. 
for almost 40 years. And that's that's my worry that, I mean, I, I see our future as either being an authoritarian society which can hold itself together, but your, your, your behavior is quite limited, or Mad Max. And uh, the awful thing is the authoritarian one is probably preferable to Mad Max. Uh, because I, I saw a comment, I've forgotten who it was, but one of the people who were one of the leading people arguing for the invasion of Iraq. And he then said he was terribly uh, sorry that he'd done that. He just realized he thought getting rid of Saddam Hussein would make the world better. But he said he saw a, a, proverb, a proverb from an Arab proverb that one day of chaos is worse than 100, 100 days of dictatorship. And he said that was true. The, the world that Iraq was thrown into uh, by getting rid of Saddam Hussein was a was 100 days of chaos uh, and, and, and they would have been better off under the dictator. And I think that the future we face is, you know, dictator or chaos and uh, economic theory. That's, a, that's a symptom of the dysfunction of the system. Absolutely. That, that, that yeah. Those are the alternatives. It doesn't need to be that. It is that no. if we continue on the trajectory of dysfunction. Yeah. Try, do you want to talk about your model here? Because it's you yeah. obviously got a written... But that, yeah. that took about 15 minutes. Yeah, about 12 minutes there. Um, so it's it's quite easy. Now, the big, the big advantage is the godly table. So when I created my 25 system state model, it was actually, it's kind of like an array in other system dynamic programs, three dimensions. So you would either be in the dimension of first time infections and you would go from susceptible, exposed, um, asymptomatic, symptomatic, hospitalized, um, intensive care, ventilated, recovered or died. And then you'd move on to the recovery um, array and you can go through the same process or you can go into the vaccinated array. Um, and using the godly table, it avoided me trying to do an array, which is simply copying a bunch of variables on the canvas and then renaming them, I could do it all in one godly table in a giant sheet. Now I can keep um, the, all the stocks either in assets or in liabilities. As long as they're all in one of those categories, they're mutually exclusive. You're in one category or you're in the next category. So it made it really simple to map out a large kind of process um not this one is very simple it's susceptible infected or recovered whereas i expanded the process are you in the hospital are you intensive in intensive care and that allowed me to create um different time constants for the likelihood that you would re be recovered or the potential that you would ultimately die so this is a very very small small mm. uh version of what i did um the, the philosophy, be, philosophy behind the design of Minsky uh, was that we wanted to make it run live so you can actually change parameters while the system is running. And mm. therefore, you can use it as like a, 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 a silicon version of the real world. So you can do stuff in silicon and see what happens. And then you decide not to make the same mistakes in the real world. So this is the entire design philosophy. And Ty's model, uh, the, big, the giant one you designed, which was 25 system states, had about... 30 or so controls people could impose and see what happened to the dynamics of the system. And if if, if, if your namesake, Boris Johnson, had had this, he would never have believed in herd immunity. Um, but it, it'd be without this capacity to sil simulate in silicon before you do it in the real world, we make the real world our experiment, experimental uh, location and heaven help us because we get the experiments wrong all the time. Mm. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. yeah. So everybody um, watching the show, make sure you actually download Minsky. Um, it's it's in continual de development. Um, so there is. I'll bring up the link here, uh, right here. Should we have it? Come on. There we go. Um, mm -hmm. You can download it for free. On, on um, so, uh, SourceForge, um, there is a section where you can report any bugs and like any software. In fact, I, I run um, uh, Vinsim. They have bugs as well, and they've had tens of millions of dollars in development. Um, whereas Minsky, what are we at, Steve? 500,000, 600,000? Maybe, maybe 600,000. 
Yeah. Yeah. So, so we we still have some bugs, and we there are bugs that you encounter um, that uh, Russell Stand issues b building the software and coding it doesn't put himself in that situation to test it they're very small like unique things and it's it's really up to the people that download the program test it out do very unique things unique modeling um to find these bugs and we we greatly appreciate if you you report them we great greatly appreciate if we see your model on twitter too like i love system dynamics and i love minsky that stuff just tickles me. So if you if you want to try it out, build a model, put it on Twitter, I'll even retweet it for so you. So I bring up one of your big models, okay, just so the Rob can see what okay. I actually do on the grand scale. Because yeah. I did I really did I'm I'm the designer and inventor of Minsky, but there's no way that I build models as cool as the ones that uh the <laughs> Ty puts together. So I want you to see that. And by the way, Ty, you should explain your background because like Rob and I both went to university course. Uh you are I call you my Ramanajan. This guy came out of the yeah. blue, doesn't have any formal training, and blows me away with what he can do. And that so was I'll, one of the great delights of this. I'll, yeah, I'll actually I'll t I'll tell my story. So the way I I met Steve kind of starts five years ago. Um, at the time, I was an operations manager at a box factory. I'm now the production manager. Um, I was looking for a way to model like all our factory machines. Um, and it's something I, I hadn't really explored before. So I came across System Dynamics. And just by luck, um, it happened to be Minsky and Steve Keen. And to dial, dial it a little further back, I've always had an interest in economics since 08. Um, and in my fir first book I, I read, of course, was Keynes, uh, The General Theory. So I'd always had an interest on how the macro economy worked. So I started watching Steve Keen videos, right, on YouTube, and just to, just to learn Minsky. Um, and so th the operations manager part, I never did use system dynamics to uh, accomplish any um, productivity gains. But what did happen is I became obsessed with modeling the economy. And then I started modeling many other things. Um, and then we started going through the pandemic and there was a lot of different models out there um and i thought well geez this is pretty neat i noticed on steve's patreon and this again is before we we had actually met and interacted um he had done a small um CERD model which is the model that i just did and adding in, exposed and dying to it so i look at it and i'm like well i can really expand this this is quite si simple it's just a bunch of system states with time constants going between them and a percentage the split recovery or die and I, I expanded that um then i was watching daniel and steve's old show that they did about a year and a half ago uh i put a question out like steve said uh i got a model and steve yet said yeah sure send it to me blah 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 and th th the rest is history that's how i met steve during the last couple years i would say um i've i've really accelerated where i've gotten into the community of system dynamics and specifically um the system dynamics society and be have become quite prominent in in that um community itself um so i've used every system dynamic program there is i've explored every model there is um and so now Dan and I have actually gone into a venture of a consulting company where we're going to strongly use system dynamics as one of our tools um, to consult with. So that's kind of my history. I have no formal education in engineering or economics. It's just something that happened by accident. And here I am. And the next thing you know, I'm I'm doing podcasts. I'm not even a podcaster. I don't even know what I'm doing, right? So, <laughs> so I'm I'm gonna let you guys talk a little more. I'm gonna bring mm -hmm. up uh, the World Two model because it's yeah. it's cleaned up and done. And it the World Two model for anybody that's watching was created um, by Jay Forrester. It's the predecessor of the World Three model, and the World Three model was for the limits to growth. So I'll bring that up if I can mm -hmm. find it. Okay. Great. Yeah. So, um, yeah, 
how's your time rob you've got literally like minutes and then you've got to get going uh, yeah. I, i'll i'll hang on a little bit longer because we talked okay, yeah have a, have a look at this it's cool stuff I'm, too. but i'm, I'm, I'm thinking to... i always think of these shows and things that i do in terms of music and uh, as i came on uh with the uh, uh, the Robert Johnson analogy, uh, I think the first half of our show was about society at the crossroads. Mm -hmm. But I think this one, and I'm really enjoying learning about Minsky. We mm -hmm. got to call this one, Come On In My Kitchen. And uh, that's a Robert <laughs> Johnson song. And I'll say something, Ty Kane, you're one hell of a chef. <laughs> yes, he definitely is. So I, I should but, add, I should add, really, I have you to thank, Rob, um, for meeting Steve. Because without that initial funding, there oh, probably yeah. wouldn't be a Minsky in the no. sense that I discovered five years ago. So in oh. six, de six degrees of separation, uh, <laughs> you are a distant, long-lost friend of mine. Yeah, <laughs> uh, that's uh, how I say positive externalities. I had no Absolutely. idea it was going to be this good. Yeah, well, look so, how beautiful this model is, too, Rob. I mean, I've got to say, yeah. Ty takes great care to make Ooh. the thing look visually attractive. You know, the, the, the people who deal models in, in uh, Stella and Vensim describe their models as being spaghetti diagrammed because you've got, to, you've got to wire everything to everything else. And one design principle I followed in Minsky was I did not want to have wires making it impossible to read a model. So you use the wires where they're necessary, but you can pass values by variable as well. And you know, Ty has taken that to a, a magnificent scale. So you get this beautiful capacity to break the model down into to digestible chunks and then he's used the, the fact we can curve the lines to to make the the visual really really appealing and i i remember there's a diagram a stellar diagram of the war in afghanistan or war in iraq i think it was and a general looking at it said if we can understand that diagram we can we can win the war meaning the diagram was a bit more complicated than the war um this sort of stuff i think is visually capable of people to look at it understand a bit of it and then understand the entire entire system so we but this is a case where the the artist who was ty has done something that the designer which is me is simply in awe of because it's so beautifully mm. done mm -hmm. gotcha. i second that emotion mm, yeah just gorgeous so imagine this you know in some ways the limits of growth was so far ahead of its time you had you know the letter a and b forming graphs and and stuff like that. So, you know, I, I wish this sort of technology had existed when neoclassicals were disparaging the limits to growth because now, now, you couldn't now, disparage something like this. Now, imagine if Keynes had access oh. to t technology <clears throat> like this because he was stuck in the 45 line degree line framework. Yeah. I don't think he wanted to be there. And if you read uh, the general <laughs> theory, right, he mm. was kind of trapped in that neoclassical mm. classical framework but he wanted to break out of it and he was kind of stuck in that uh static analysis um and i just i often wondered if he had lived you know mm. another 20 years longer and got to see the you know jay forrester come up and have some of those initial tools would his analysis change or would his analysis have greater strength because he had those mm. tools to show it. That would have been interesting. Yeah. And, you know, it's because when I look at what the neoclassicals use, they've used a program called Dynair, which is a, it's a module on, built on top of MATLAB. And it is so shitty. It is absolutely awful as, a, as an interface for designing anything. Uh, and what they do is they push students through these, you know, um, sausage factory education system with lots and lots of very simplistic mathematics they think is advanced mathematics difference equations and stuff like that but all the various components of a dsg model that what they've been forced to learn and they work so bloody hard to get it done that they think it must be science uh whereas what we're, we're building with minsky is now which is sexually appealing okay it looks beautiful you want to look at it and and it actually it's live it 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 can put your uh, your insights into a visual reinforcing form while letting you live with the complexity. And that's the important thing. Uh, rather than being scared by complexity, it's actually exciting when you put it in these frameworks. It's all scary in its own way, but yeah. uh, it's an exciting form of scary. 
So we we got Rob. I know you, you're supposed to meet uh, family or friends. So I don't want you to feel like you have to stay and interrupt anything. If you've got to go, make sure you you do what you have to do. We've really loved having you on today. This has been a lot of fun. Yeah. We, we're going to want to do it again sometime in the future, maybe towards yeah. the summer. Definitely want you back again, for sure. And I've learned about your background that I wasn't aware of, so I'm very pleased to learn about that. And you're going to be quite a few references to chase up as well. So I think I'll do some reading shortly. Okay, well, before I sign off, we've talked about all of the uh, treacherous or, or anxiousness mm. of the current circumstance. And I always leave my young scholars, I usually, when I present to them, I follow uh, some work which says, impart things to people with the arts and then explain. Mm -hmm. And I've really enjoyed exploring with you today. So I, I put down a couple of songs that like when I talk to my YSI people, try to convey the message. And uh, it seemed to me the uncertainty is captured by my home city's Diana Ross, theme from Mahogany. Do you know where you're going to? Do you like, like the things that life is showing you? And I don't think anybody would say yes right off the bat. But then I go to a little more optimism. And Dionne Warwick, she talks about what the world needs now. And yeah. what the world needs now is love. And she also comes on with Stevie Wonder, Elton John, and uh, who was it? Jada, Gladys Knight. So two of them from Detroit. And they sing, that's what friends are for. And Steve, <laughs> that's part of it. That's part of it. Because with people like you, I can go to the song that I use when I feel that despair. That's by Pablo Cruz. It's called Love Will Find a Way. What you all are doing with the beauty of your words, of your models, and with your minds and with your effort gives me greater confidence. There is a place that people can go to reinvigorate their faith and their enthusiasm, even in these anxious times, not be drawn off course by false gods, and I, I want to thank you all. I'm very grateful for having the experience with you. Thank you. And did I, you, you've, you, you were the seed that helped us create what you saw today. So many thanks to you too. And say Absolutely. how it's on for me. Will do. And uh, to be continued back on, uh, we can do it as a panel. We'll bring you all on my podcast and uh, we'll do round two. That'd be wow. great. That's good. Fantastic. Look forward to it. Great. Thanks, okay. Well, thanks for thanks for setting it up, Ty. Thanks for helping me get organized to be on with you today. Yeah, it was and a great thank pleasure. You. Thank you. Thank bye you, bye, Rob. Bye bye. Mm. Wow. Oh, very lovely, man. Very yeah, lovely elegant, man. Hey? Just elegant. Yeah. <laughs> very very emotional. Very 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 warm emotional guy. And um, yeah. And uh, and and great background in music. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so uh, 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 I didn't realize the Detroit band. One of my good friends that I'm actually out of touch with just by sheer circumstance, but uh, he's also a Detroit boy. And a, a lot of what, when you live through and see a, like cool. Detroit looks like it was bombed by an atom bomb. Are you, are you Detroit too? No, just look at this, the way our our, our backgrounds oh, are. Oh, yeah. yeah. Like in the together, same, yeah. We're, we're, we're like, I'm on ties. <laughs> this is not concentric circle. This is like what? <laughs> very cute that's I, I i prefer chaos so i'm gonna do oh, it yeah. this. oh no that's even better yeah yeah <laughs> everybody thank you for chatting thank you for yeah, thank you. Yeah. St sticking along um i think it's really worked out that we've put the chat up there we were concerned mm -hmm. about trolls many months ago but we've gathered a good group of people um mm -hmm. to join us each each weekend and it's a lot of fun seeing your conversation happen on the side it's a lot of fun to interact with you if you have any yeah. last questions for steve you better type them now because he's going to get uh, you want to go and do a saturday night maybe have drink a, yeah yeah drink a couple pints maybe in amsterdam what i'm in be? amsterdam i did pints aren't necessary in amsterdam <laughs> all right <laughs> <laughs> 
uh, if you, between those lines, I suppose. Now, I, I've got a question <laughs> here. In Amsterdam, yeah. is it, because Heineken is is kind of like an international staple from from the Netherlands. I believe. Mm -hmm. Is it just a cheap beer there? Is it just no, something? No, no, no. It's, it's quite a major beer. So if you like, there's actually, we, Nisa and I, my wife and I were talking about actually going and doing a tour of the Heineken plant, because there's a huge Heineken plant in the heart of, Am of Amsterdam, about maybe three kilometers from where we are here. We haven't done it yet. We will do it. So it's actually quite a serious, serious beer. And it's part of the, part of the culture of Amsterdam in that sense that it was where Heineken originated. Not that I'm a beer drinker. I prefer, I, I've, I've got to start giving up one. I'm getting to this age where arthritis is getting to me and I find the next day I'm feeling, you know, my, my joints are worse after a glass of wine, which is a pity because I really do enjoy a good glass of red wine. But if you're going to get these intoxicants, well, Amsterdam's the town for you. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> so I've heard. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. What? Well, okay. One hey, other qu good question. Get some good question. Ari's just asked a really good question here. Okay. Let me let me bring what? that up here. Yeah. Okay. Let's bring that on the screen. Oh, I've got a lot of chats here. That's a good question. Okay. Let's. Bring I think they play an incredibly important role. All right. That's a very good question. I think they play an incredibly important role <laughs> because they imply that we can have a perfect system if you follow my idea of money, and uh, like you know. Uh, and, and so the commodity money ideas, which libertarians fall for all the time, the idea that money should be an asset and not a liability, uh, that money should not be what it actually is, which is a third party, the promise of a third party to pay. Uh, those sorts of ideas uh, feed into that libertarian framework because uh, if you have something which is an asset, like you think about Bitcoin, Bitcoin is an asset to the holder and a liability to no one. And that means it's not a financial asset, where a financial asset is an asset to someone and a liability to somebody else. And that implies we can all accumulate the assets. We don't, uh, you know, we can all go out and get Bitcoin, we can all go get gold, et cetera, et cetera. And it implies an independence that feeds into that libertarian mindset. So I don't need you. I can, if I accumulate enough gold, I'm okay on my own type thing. So I think those, I think those visions play a very important role in enforcing that right-wing commodity money type views and once you, when, if you can show that they don't actually work that those those systems of uh, commodity money don't actually function then you get to have a, a more nuanced vision of what capitalism uh, actually is and what human society could be so I think they play a very very large role in enforcing that uh, libertarian perspectives interesting hmm. Daniel, you're back. I don't know. We're we're probably. I think we're we're reaching that natural end yeah, point where we had the so. ex extension here. So I want to thank everybody for tuning in this week. Uh, if you can make a comment underneath the video, not in the chat, it really helps with the algorithm. It overwhelms the trolls. We know they're all over YouTube, all social media, and I. I want the good com the what happens in YouTube is the positive comments get pushed to the top. And that's what we want to see. We want a good legacy here for the information we put out. Um, and it really helps even if you take uh, two seconds to type in great show, it boosts the algorithm. So this show will get uh, shown with impressions you know, later on down the line, like over the next month. And more people will see it, more people will join into the live, and it's it becomes a fruitful exercise, you know, for everybody's time. So, Dan... Yeah, that's a, yep. That Dan, was the benefit of the great, 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 great ghost on the half shell, by the way. Pardon me. Okay. Yes. yes. Drinking some water. Yes, exactly. Dan, you didn't get to talk very much this week because uh, Rob and Steve were having a big massive powwow which is i think very much needed um mm. any final comments dan look i mean i want to appeal to everybody my role here in this show is i mean it is steve keen and friends and so the only time i stand up uh to say something or to add or contribute to anything in the show is if i think if it's a value to the conversation and i've got no ego that if there's nothing to bring up at the particular time uh i'm just listening and and uh, I'm just just happy to be here, and I think that this was a really, um, really beautiful show. I really enjoyed participating. So thanks yeah, everybody I, that's that's supporting. Thank you all. Supporting okay. And, 
Yeah. See you next right. week. Hopefully, yeah. my internet will be better than it was last time I was in London. Let's hope so. Anyway. All right, guys. Well, we'll see okay. you next. We'll see you next week.